Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Broadband and broadband expansion have been big buzzwords for some time. Now, never so more than in the past year, the local, state, and federal levels of government, the pandemic that sent millions home for school and work, helped show where broadband coverage was lacking. We'll discuss broadband high-speed internet expansion with Frank Smith, president and CEO of the Roanoke Valley Broadband Authority, Botetourt County Administrator Gary LaRue, Dr. Scott Midkiff is Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer at Virginia Tech, and Ray Lemura is President of the VCTA and the Broadband Association of Virginia. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Dr. Midkiff, uh, Scott, in a nutshell, tell people exactly what broadband is and how it helps deliver high-speed internet. Well, what, what exactly is broadband is uh, point of debate actually there's some discussion about that right now and so uh, the Federal Communications Commission the FCC has a definition today that it is uh, 25 megabits per second download and 3 megabits per second upload from from your home or business up to the internet and uh, what that means is that uh, you know you would have 25 megabits of capacity to uh, sort of download uh, traffic and and three megabits per second to upload um, and for a lot of applications that you know that that's a very reasonable uh, internet connection right uh, good for email good for almost all web browsing it's where really when you start getting into video and some of the other demanding applications for that becomes a problem uh, it's probably reasonable for some level of streaming services if you're watching, you know, Netflix or YouTube or things like that. Where that's really created some problems, especially in the past year, as work from home has become the norm and as K-12 and uh, universities and community colleges have pushed more of their teaching to remote is for video conferencing. Uh, and so, for example, uh, Zoom would, you know, sort of prefer that you have about uh, three to four megabits per second up. And so the 25 slash three asymmetrical sort of definition of bandwidth uh, breaks down a little bit even for one user. But when you think about having, you know, one or two parents that are working from home, one, two, three, four, five children that are attending classes remotely with uh, synchronous video that they're uh, participating in a class with, it becomes a challenge. Hmm. Uh, one of the points of discussion now in Congress is asking the FCC to look at that and perhaps uh, 100 megabits per second symmetrical, 100 megabits per second to the home and 100 megabits per second up would be sort of the new norm of what would be considered served. Um, you know, whether, I, I think that's a great goal uh, we have to think about the fact that nothing comes for free and we have to sort of look at, you know, limits of what we can deploy. And, but if, if we look at what we define as an, as an underserved area, uh, today we have areas that are considered served, not underserved, but served, um, that really aren't getting all the capacity that they need to, to do what people are doing with the internet today. Okay. Uh, Gary LaRue, um Talk about where you're you're calling in from today, Gary. And when the pandemic hit in a, in a county like Botetourt County, which has a lot of rural parts, very spread out, did it? Did you immediately? And I know this is something you've been working on for a couple of years, Gary. But did you see where the gaps were in your broadband expansion, where, where your broadband network was? Uh, Gene, really, what ended up taking place was that we've been working on broadband expansion since 2017 actually even prior to that. So this did not catch us off guard. However, we were trying to roll it out even faster. And so that has been the pressure that we've been under as a locality, trying to uh, find any and every way to actually um, expand broadband into the community. And as mentioning about where I'm actually from, uh, reporting from, I'm actually at the preserve at um, 
at Crooked Run this morning. It's a uh, it's a, a corporate retreat center, if you will, in the uh, outermost sections of uh, uh, Botetourt County. It's uh, I'm in the middle of a 500 acre preserve, and I have a fiber connection uh, that I'm operating off of this morning that was was not here six months ago, and it's actually running at a speed of 300 megabits synchronous, which is three times of what. Uh, Dr. Midkiff was just mentioning about was the uh, uh, the future of broadband. So uh, as a result, what we ended up doing is working with the local incumbents, uh, local incumbent providers, and trying to get them to um, add in areas, uh, expand services, and things of that sort. Uh, broadband is not a, a, a product that is actually delivered by a locality, by a county. However, we have encouraged that in lots of different ways. And so in the, the, the connection that I'm uh, operating off of here is actually being brought by the Craig Bonitad Electric Cooperative that ended up adding in a tremendous amount of uh, fiber uh, into the community and, uh, and is creating business opportunities. It's the telehealth, the telemedicine, remote work and uh, remote medical uh, needs of the community. And that's really where we are, Gene. Mm-hmm. And instantly it makes that facility where you're at, Gary, more commercially viable as a, as a retreat location for a corporate meeting. By Absolutely. Ha- by this, ha- in, reality, in, in reality, this would not have actually been able to have been a corporate retreat center without that broadband connection. And that has only come online six months ago in, uh, in earnest. And, uh, and delivered and turned up here just recently. So uh, much to that point is that we can end up having anyone living in this part of the world in today's environment of sending large files, uh, radiologists to uh, x-rays, to uh, engineering documents or whatever it might end up being. We could end up having people that are living in rural parts of Botetourt County now that could not do that previously. Mm-hmm. And before I let you go um, on this question, is you talk about some of these partnerships, Gary. You've got one going with Lumos in, in the Buchanan area to, to expand broadband there, correct? Yes. So we've been very blessed that we've actually had two VATI uh, awards. One of those was with the, the Craig Botetourt Electric Co-op that I mentioned. Then we also had a VATI award that was that was just awarded. It was the only county in the Commonwealth, single county in the Commonwealth that was actually awarded. And that was with a local incumbent provider, Lumos. And so they're gonna be picking up 548 new customers in the Buchanan area, just south of Buchanan. And, uh, and so that's gonna be fiber to the home also. So what we really did was help these providers to coordinate and got them um, in the same room tried to uh, uh, not overlap services and uh, work in a cooperative manner in conjunction with the Roanoke Valley Broadband Authority and with Frank Smith and, and some of those efforts mm-hmm. as well. Ray Lemure, do you see this as a way to go in the future that there'll be more of these partnerships between providers and, and broadband authorities and maybe where some of the people that you represent, some of the c- cable providers become uh, really more of the last mile providers? Do you see? the industry sort of evolving that way in Virginia? Well, uh, again, thanks for having me, Gene. And, you know, Gary brought up uh, the VADI, the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative, which was created by the General Assembly in 2017. And what this is, is a public-private partnership to extend broadband to those who are unserved. And so the priority of past governors and the legislature and the Broadband Advisory Council is to really laser focus on those who do not have the broadband infrastructure on a residential manner at all and to get them connected. And as you noted in the beginning, um, you know, it has been heightened based upon the pandemic, uh, the urgency to get broadband deployed and constructed to those areas that are unserved. But be mindful. This is the area, this is the hardest group of folks who are less dense than any other place. It is more costly to get to these folks who are unserved. It is more barriers that you have to you know, work through. Uh, our friends with the railroads, I know there's a lot of railroad crossings you have out there. 
there's pole attachment fees, there's permitting. I see Frank chuckling because I'm sure he's had some <laughs> challenges with our railroad friends and our friends with VDOT. So there are a lot of barriers that go into place into you know, getting broadband deployed to those who are unserved. But the, another focus that has been really highlighted through this pandemic is the adoption. So once you go through the process of getting the permits and constructing broadband, then you have the challenge of getting folks to adopt the service. And this is a challenge. And you note the, the actions of our members I'm very pleased to share with you that our folks have focused on the adoption as a key issue. And they provide broadband to folks who are on free and reduced school lunch for $9.95. And mm. so you know, there's a tremendous focus to, once the broadband is constructed, then getting people to take and adopt the service. And historically, what we have seen is the take rate, meaning folks who will take the service, is about 40% once it's adopted. It's not like building commercial broadband where you have you know, a specific customer who has a specific need, who's giving you that specific ask. You're building with the hope that they take the service, that they come. So there's a, a lot of effort and there's been efforts through the legislature this year to make a focus on those folks who have access to broadband to take the service, but at the same time to make sure we have programs in place and initiatives in place to get broadband constructed to those who don't have it, those who are unserved. And construction, unfortunately, it takes a long time. It's not something you can wiggle your nose and have it built. The adoption can be a much faster approach. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we, I would say also, uh, you, you mentioned that we are the last mile provider through the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative through VADI. It's technology agnostic. So while you know, ours is the pipe that goes in the ground or it gets attached to the utility pole. This is also a program that's available to the electric cooperatives, as Gary had mentioned, also to, to Frank and his team, and also to the wireless folks. So Virginia is such a diverse state. You really need to have as many tools in the toolbox in the in ability to make construction to get it out there. Hmm. Uh, Frank Smith, the Roanoke Valley Broadband Authority uh, President and CEO. We're, we're at Blue Ridge PBS, and this is sort of one of the, the hubs. Uh, Frank, talk about that. This is where the ribbon cutting was a couple years ago when you got off the ground, and there's some big box over in the corner that has something to do with you. But talk about the progress the Broadband Authority has made in, in, in laying fiber optic cable. Well, thanks, Gene, for inviting me here. I'd love to talk about that. So basically, you talked about the uh, – the uh, kickoff we had back, uh, back in around April of uh, 2016. So it's been approximately almost five years. So within our network, we had the uh, initial goal was to build 50 miles. Uh, right now we're up to 110 miles. And what you referenced as far as uh, Blue Ridge PBS, large box, hopefully all the lights are green. <laughs> green is good from that standpoint. Um, that's one of our switching centers and Blue Ridge PBS has been a great partner uh, of ours. And we have uh, nine switching centers, which are located across the, uh, the four localities of Bata Todd, City of Roanoke, City of Salem, uh, County of Roanoke. And in addition to that, we also have been working with uh, Mr. LaRue, Gary and his team, uh, specifically closely on different projects up in Bata Todd. So some of the things we're working on right now, what we call our co-location centers, where other providers uh, come in and they work with us, they co-locate their equipment and also brings in other services. And one of those is actually in the Greenfield Training and Education Center. So for us, right now, the progress has been very good. Uh, the partnerships have been good. And I think what's interesting too, and we appreciate everybody here on the call because everybody plays a role in this. We're all trying to serve folks. We wanna make sure that all boats rise with the same tide. And that really has to go back down to the fact that uh, right now on our network, we were designed to be an open access network, which translates into whether you're private, you're public, you're new, next generation, whatever, that you have an infrastructure that you can ride on. So I'm pleased to say right now, we have eight different providers on our network, four what I call the traditional established providers who are on our network, and then we have four next generation providers on our network. So it's been, um, it's been a great privilege to serve, but it really the key thing is we need to make sure that this area can compete, and that's what we're working on all together. So again, it's a privilege to serve, we're public servants. I wanted to ask you some of the higher speeds that Dr. Midkiff, uh, uh, Scott was talking about. Sure. What you've got in the ground now, 
Frank, let's say the technology improved and there the, the, was a need for a higher speed. Can what you have in the ground now handle it? Yeah, I think a lot of us here on the, on the broadband team here at the Roanoke Valley come out of several, um, I like to say that I'm a, a millennial in my head, but not in my hair, which is obviously silver or gray. So we've come out of the, uh, the background of the industry for a while, a couple of decades. And uh, part of our team is we built the infrastructure from the beginning so it would be future-proofed, which translates into, uh, there's a term we like to use, it's called a forklift upgrade. So if something becomes obsolete or past its useful life, you have to pull it out and throw it out. And we were very careful with our partnerships as far as our architecture. So to answer your question even more directly, uh, right now we started with offering uh, up to a gig circuit, which is a thousand meg from that standpoint. But now we've been upgrading the network and the, what we call the core infrastructure to get up into the 100, uh, 100, gig, 100 gig speed and so on. So it's been a good experience for us and we've been able to uh, be able to address the growth. Uh, and uh, I apologize, I have a light that's on a timer to save energy and I'm not moving around fast enough. Yeah, so here okay. we go. It's eco-friendly, <laughs> there you go. Um, Let's go. Let me go back to Scott. Um, talk about Scott, what high-speed broadband means to the Virginia Tech community, the corporate research center there, Scott, where you were on the board, uh, what does it mean? And, and does having high-speed internet, which uh, I assume you have at the corporate research center and all that, does it help attract tenants? Does it help attract business? Oh, absolutely. And so for Virginia Tech, I mean, broadband means a lot of things. So. Um, you know, wireless came up as one of the options. We have a really strong wireless research group. Uh, so we have, you know, faculty that are doing research really to try to, you know, figure out how wireless uh, helps with deploying uh, rural broadband and, and with lots of other applications. Um, you know, on our campus, we have, uh, you know, researchers doing, uh, you know, transferring very large data set, working on, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, applications, visualization that require the university itself to have uh, very high data rates. We have a 100 gigabit per second uh, connectivity to uh, internet to and other research networks. Um, teaching increasingly, it's not, you know, it's not just sort of going to the web to get class material, it's, it's downloading videos, it's, it's having interactive video. Um, and then, you know, at, you mentioned the Corporate Research Center, which is affiliated with Virginia Tech, part of the Virginia Tech Foundation. And uh, we, the university, don't provide um, internet to the Corporate Research Center ten tenants unless they are part of Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that's an area where actually the Corporate Research Center is thinking about what's what's the next generation. You know, I think the, the CRC has done a great job of, of providing connectivity for tenants to date, but um, it really foresees that uh, the demands are gonna go up for its tenants. And we wanna make sure that the CRC can provide not just you know good internet service, but great exceptional inter internet service, because that is a differentiator uh, in terms of attracting people to that location. And one of the things that's interesting too, and the pandemic has highlighted it, you know, we have students and employees uh, throughout the region, right? And as we, uh, exit the pandemic and go into what we call the next normal. Uh, we're going to have a lot more employees, I think, that are working uh, all or mostly from home that, you know, need good connectivity. Um, we're going to, you know, continue to have, uh, you know, residential experience is really important to Virginia Tech and will continue to be, but we'll see more, uh, more content being delivered over in, in digital form uh, and remotely. And so students need access. And so it's, it's really the full spectrum. You know, we're, we're a large employer, we're a research institution, um, but we also have, you know, sort of big needs ourselves, both on campus and at the CRC. Mm -hmm. I, wanted to, you know, you, I wanted to bring up wireless technology and maybe Frank and Gary. Gary, any of the expansion that you, you are doing, is it all in the ground? Is any of it wireless? Because I, I think Bedford County's put up towers. And is that technically high-speed broadband? Um, in reality, Gene, uh, some of the work that we've done is uh, is putting up some E node Bs. That it's uh, the technology that is emerging. Oh, CBRS and ONGO, I think, is the some of the new phrasing of that. But uh, 
but one of the things we're 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 working to see how we can end up using that to uh, mobilize throughout the community so that we could end up picking up uh, uh, specific areas that are hard to get to or those uh, very cost uh, uh, costly areas because of the density as Ray was speaking of earlier because uh, being able to actually pick up some of those areas may end up being a way to actually do that. We also feel like that that, that technology may end up helping us solve some other problems within the community, uh, along with uh, telemedicine and telehealth and, and things of that sort. So we're really exploring that and seeing what can happen. I just read an article just uh, recently, it was talking about Zoom towns. And in reality, uh, thinking about a Zoom county, uh, a Zoom County of where we end up having uh, broadband distributed in multiple layers and in multiple directions with mo with with access from mobile to uh, to fixed. And so, yes, we are exploring all of that because we really feel as if we're in a spot, in a place, uh, 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 technically in a place as well as in a location in the Commonwealth that could end up benefiting from uh, other folks bringing their talent to our community and actually working remote, m much to the effect of what Scott was talking about at Virginia Tech. Uh, I know that there are people in our community that are working for the Department of Defense or they're working for um, uh, CDC or they're working for other places in our community and you would not realize that or would not know that, but they are. And we're going to be seeing more and more of that kind of activity, I think. Let me go to uh, Ray and, and Frank. Uh, uh, Senator Warner sent out something after the rescue plan was uh, approved and said there's $17 billion in it for broadband expansion. Talked about still 700,000 people in Virginia that lack access to high-speed internet, or they did during the pandemic. So, Ray and, and, and Frank, do you see room for innovation? Do you see room for providers and for the broadband authority to just, to, uh, just maybe to help foster the next generation of, of, of technology even to get more people broadband. Why don't you start out, Ray? Sure, well, uh, Gene, interestingly, you know, our industry has uh, an entity called Cable Labs out in Colorado, where you know, engineers come in every day thinking, what is the cool thing we can do with the broadband infrastructure that we have created? So that is a continuing, uh, mindset of our industry is to continue to improve and and, and build a, as frank was saying you know infrastructure that is resilient and goes on from time to time i do want to bring up one one part that scott was talking a little bit about the the folks working from home too is one thing we have discovered and really kind of learned through this pandemic is as folks were forced out of their office into a home environment uh maybe the products they were using in their home were a little old or dated. So their servers may have been older, uh, their computers may have been older, and that would often slow down, you know, the speed connectivity they're having. So it just created another challenge that the industry had to work with the, our residents and consumers uh, to be mindful that you have to upgrade your, your own technology within your own household to make sure that you're getting uh, those uh, those best speeds as possible. Frank, I see you laughing. Uh, you can identify with some of the issues Ray was bringing up. Well, I think Ray's yeah, he's right on the money. No pun intended there, because <laughs> part of the thing is you've got the equipment in the house, and uh, so we live in the city of Roanoke. We've been here 21 years. My wife grew up here. Uh, we are a, a long-term customer of one of the service providers. We have a good working relationship with them. But the key thing is we upgraded service. But in order to do that, you've got to make sure your router or other electronics are upgraded because otherwise you're creating an artificial bottleneck. And it's not the responsibility, excuse me, they're going to lights again. They're not the responsibility of the provider, but you've got to be to kind of take ownership of that and work in partnership. So I think that's part of it too. But I also think on Ray's point too, talking about the cable labs and the innovation that's being done there, for us, one of our goals was to help provide, uh, drive competition, drive partnerships, drive investment, but it goes back to the term innovation, making sure we're driving innovation here. And I think this is what Gary was talking about earlier and working with his team up there on some of the CBRS projects, taking a look at the proper partnerships to bring into the area. I think that's been good, but we're also looking at other areas. How do we deliver the service, but just not deliver the service, but what is the impact that we're gonna have? What's the problem that we're gonna solve? 
because part of the things it's great to have the technology but if you don't know what the application is and what that application is the problem it's going to solve that's a challenge so i think collectively here on the team everybody's been working hard to say great we've got these tools or these additional arrows in our quiver let's make sure that we apply them appropriately to make this area compete uh, because this is one thing i've learned from the beginning i've been here almost six years is that we don't compete necessarily against Ferrari, just against the Richmonds or the Washington DCs. There is we're really competing against places that have great quality of life, such as Bozeman, Montana. You look at that and the infrastructure they've built up there. You take a look at Asheville. And those are the things collectively here as a team that we do to make sure this area is, we're able to compete so we can retain and attract talent and also drive innovation. And this goes back to what Gary is talking about, Zoom cities mm -hmm. and some of the other things. So I think it's, uh, it's a, there's a lot of great things going on, driving that innovation and making sure there's something that it can be tied to, to make a difference in the community. Got about 30 seconds left. Gary Luro, I'll give you the last word. Can you uh, identify that this is an economic development issue, especially for a more rural county like Botetourt to get broadband expansion? Absolutely top of the tier as far as uh, economic activity in our county. It depends upon broadband deployment and we could not have done this without the broadband commission that was appointed by the board of supervisors and the uh the support that they have provided dr max scott horn is the chair of the broadband commission he's chair of the board of supervisors and also really working in hand in hand with the broadband authority and frank and his team has just been miraculous so those are our secret weapons if you will gene in the economic development in body all right gentlemen we're gonna have to leave it there this has been business matters have a great day if you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.